I'd like to introduce uh, the executive director of Transportation Choices uh, and a, a friend of mine who I get to share brunch with uh, about once a month, Shafali Ranganathan. Good evening. How's everyone doing today? So first, I want to apologize about my voice. Um, every campaign season, I get a visit from my old buddy, the campaign cold. Um, this campaign cold is usually related to the size of the campaign that I'm working on, so it's a bad one this time. And, um, and it's fitting as I talk to you about campaigns that I get to share the stage with my campaign cold. Uh, with that said, I want to tell you a story. So this story has everything. This story has, this is the story of a city that dared to dream big. This is a story that has drama, lots of it, a lot of suspense, typically on election night, and an improbable cast of characters who dared to challenge the status quo. The story has a great ending, or I guess you could call it a new beginning. Welcome to Seattle. This is the story of Seattle and how we found a way to get things done. Welcome to Seattle, where we like our coffee strong and our process long. Where we finally have a train, it just took 40 years of pain. Where 60% don't drive to work, and Orca Pass is more than just a nice perk. Where we just made a huge investment in transit, bike, and ped, and not just in plain old pavement. Once upon a time, in the long, not so distant past, we were a city that said no a lot. I'm sure you've heard some version of this sad tale in a session or a panel at this conference. In the 60s, we said no to a rail system, not once, but twice. In the 90s, we said no to light rail before we said yes. In 2000, we said no to the monorail after we said yes. And just when you thought that all hope was lost, we began to say yes a lot. From buses to trains to sidewalks to bike lanes, you name it, and this city has said yes to it. Uh, all this week, we've showcased our yeses in your workshops and your sessions, and uh, it's been fun to show off a little, I'll admit that. I'd like to tell you that we have some kind of secret sauce, or perhaps it's because we legalized pot. I don't know. <laughs> but the reality was, is that this is no accident. So now that I have your attention, I am going to introduce you to the characters of this story. So we have the politicians. These are your elected officials, your mayor, your council members, the dreamers, the doers people willing to push the envelope, sometimes with a little bit of gentle nudging. We have the people who I love to call my city peeps. These are your planners, your bureaucrats, your rank and file, the people who just want to be better than just okay. They want to do great things and they want to build a great city. You've probably heard from many of them at this conference. And then we have what I will call the coalition of the wise and the willing. So that's my organization, Transportation Choices, alongside an amazing cohort of bicycle, pedestrian, social justice, environmental nonprofits, alongside the business community and the labor community. These are the stubborn people who just didn't get the message when they were told no. And trust me, we were told no a lot. So, and then finally, we have the people of Seattle. Um, these are the people who have started to say yes over and over again. And in many ways, they have bought into a vision of a better Seattle even before us advocates even dreamed it to be possible. The relationship between these characters, like any good story, is complex and multidimensional. Sometimes it involves the kind of drama that rivals the best Hollywood has to offer. But what brings us together, what is our North Star? that guides us is that we all want Seattle to be a vibrant, affordable, thriving, and connected city. In this story, there is one simple truth. 
One thing that we know to be true, successful cities stand tall on the shoulders of a strong advocacy community. This is especially the case in Seattle. We have an incredible civic community here, from transit advocates to bike and pedestrian advocates, from social justice organizations, environmentalists, labor, business, urbanists. Every single day, we push, we challenge, we support, and we empower the people that run this city to be better. And we have a lot to show for it. So in the last eight years, Scott talked about 14 months. In the last eight years, we have won more than $20 billion in transportation investments for this region. In 2008, we expanded light rail to a 52-mile system. In 2015, we won a transit measure that has given Seattle the best bus service it's ever had. And last year, against all odds, we won a campaign to invest nearly a billion dollars in bike, ped, and transit investments the single largest investment that Seattle has ever made in transportation. And it's not just the ballot wins, although I will tell you, those are nice, especially when the local media writes you off and your war on cars. But beyond ballot measures, our shared advocacy is bringing about transformational change in Seattle and beyond. We are challenging long-held beliefs of what it takes to move people and goods efficiently. We are talking about how do we connect people to opportunity? Who is at the table making those decisions? And how do we build power as a community to make change? And our relationships have moved far beyond your typical check the box coalitions to those of true partnerships, ones with shared values that are rooted in a healthy and equitable city. Now these partnerships, they didn't happen overnight. I'll tell you, there's a lot of hand-wringing, mistrust, pontificating, soul-searching, and process. We love our process, and a lot of meetings. I mean, a lot of meetings. But what became clear to us is that as we worked in our silos, it made us less effective. And the transportation needs in our community were too great too urgent for us to keep doing the same thing and expect different results. So it wasn't really an aha moment. More, it was a realization that despite our perceived differences, we wanted the same outcomes, working together to ensure that we would be better, stronger. So as an advocate, I tend to speak my mind a lot. It gets me into trouble more often than I can admit and gives my poor communication director lots of headaches. Sometimes I speak out to challenge conventional wisdom, like the time that I told a local reporter that free parking was not a God-given right. Let's just say I got a lot of angry emails and phone calls. But beyond the quotable quotes, this space that has been created in Seattle for that honest dialogue, where we don't always have to be on the same page about something, has allowed organizations like mine to thrive and be successful. We don't always agree with each other, but by allowing for that dialogue, we make sure that we can just roll up our sleeves and get it done, resolve our differences, and work together. I challenge you and I urge you to foster this type of dialogue in your communities. It is the bedrock of a trusting and long-lasting relationship between cities and communities. And this dialogue has created new space for new partners. Transportation is one of those issues that cuts across all sectors. It's about connection to jobs, schools, public health, housing, land use, the environment, and more. We have seized upon this intersectionality to build powerful and unusual coalitions that have become so much more than the sum of their parts. Leading social justice organizations such as One America and Puget Sound Sage are not just part of our story, they are writing the chapters on how to create equitable transportation solutions for Seattle. And the results speak for themselves. We now have the largest low-income transit fare, Orca Lift, in the country. And we partnered with King County Metro and the city, homelessness advocates, and downtown businesses to get it done. The Move Seattle investments that we talked about, 
they are prioritizing investments in underinvested communities of color and low income neighborhoods. We partnered with traditionally white led bike and pet groups and social justice organizations to get those done. And the Sound Transit 3 plan that Scott talked about, that's on the ballot. This will have some of the strongest affordable housing provisions in partnership with the transit agency that we have seen in the country. So again, I said there was no secret sauce, but maybe there is. The ingredients are simple, open communication, a willingness to share power and decision making, and you have to be in it to win it. You have to stick it out for the long haul. Practice this intentionally and often, and you will be well on your way to creating a powerful network of stakeholders who are deeply invested in the success of your city. You know, as I look towards the future, I am filled with hope and anxiety all at once. Our region is contemplating a $54 billion transit investment that will transform our cities forever. We're in the midst of a climate crisis and an affordable housing crisis. We do not have the luxury to wait to act. And much is riding on the shoulders, the tiny shoulders of advocates such as, uh, such as me. But then I remember we're all in this together. I remember why we do the work for communities for the future. And I am reminded by the words of Nelson Mandela, it always seems impossible until it's done. Thank you and have a good evening.